Okay, hello everybody, hello again. Uh, okay, it's my pleasure to be here with you all. Thanks to, to the project Icon Mix. Uh, so um, let's do it. You will have uh, five minutes, presenters will have five minutes and then uh, another five minutes for the answer. I'm going to be sweet but hard, sorry. <laughs> so after your five minutes are done, I'm going to turn my mic on and I will ask you, you have 30 seconds to finish. This way, we'll, we will have 19, 20 minutes to discuss, even if there are some things that are that couldn't be told or that just were are still in the paper. So we will have time or even in the lunch, we can also continue this conversation. So thank you very much. Uh, we are going to begin with uh, Paula Igareda. She's going to present the, the text from Jacobo. El cómic como sujeto de estudio de la historia de la cultura escrita, el caso de la historieta histórica española. Thank you very much. You have five minutes. Uh, well, I'm the first one here to make this kind of exercise uh, on the working paper on, uh, of Jacobo. So I would like to apologize uh, for how it might come out uh, because I have no one as a model before me. And, and also because um, it was a little bit difficult Jacobo, uh, to understand the, oh, sorry, the text. Uh, the document is written in Spanish, no problem about that, but uh, it was for me difficult to read. I understand that it, it is a draft, uh, but the density of some paragraphs, and I'm being just critical because I, I want you to do the same with me uh, on Friday, uh, but that that way of, of being written um, makes uh, that perhaps my understanding uh, is not uh, what was expected, okay? So I apologize in advance uh, if this is the case. Well, Jacobo proposes uh, to develop a research on the comic from a historical discipline. He proposes them to develop a methodology to then apply it to the Spanish historical comic. Uh, the way I understood it. So to do so, he starts from the history of written culture, uh, which is interested in who the author is or the authors are, uh, what motivates uh, his, her work, and what is uh, his, her intentions. Uh, its main representative is Petrucci, Petrucci, Petrucci uh, who proposes a kind of questionnaire as a methodological uh, tool to be applied to its text uh, to be analyzed. And I will comment uh, very fast on each of the six questions of this questionnaire with my ideas, comments, and observations. Uh, first of all, um, I don't understand uh, exactly uh, what we want or what Jacobo wants to obtain um, as a final result when applying this questionnaire. Uh, what is the main objective? No, Petrucci says that is to know the way you know, the load of society in writing and its production. And what does Jacobo, I'm launching here, no? Uh, what does Jacobo want to achieve? Um, do you, Jacobo, have any material already in mind to analyze, to better illustrate to us maybe what a specific uh, objectives are uh, sought with this research? Uh, and I think that the gender is very, no, big, broad. Um, is there a historical period that interests you uh, more than others and for uh, which this methodological proposal is uh, applicable? Um, so first of those uh, six uh, questions in the questionnaire in your paper, what does it say? So we have to observe the text and illustrations together with introductory uh, text of the author or characters and so on. So it does make sense as a starting point uh, before analyzing any work, no comment about that. Second question was, when was it made? The year in which it was launched, the comic not to the uh, market in case uh, this may have influenced the work since the Franco dictatorship is uh, mentioned in your paper. I wonder if today the when uh, has as much weight as it did back then. Uh, the third question was the where, uh, sorry. Uh, and the paper says the location of the publisher may indicate and justify the theme. So I understand that publishers have their reasons for publishing uh, this or um, not that, uh, but I don't know if it is the geographical location uh, that uh, or what determines this aspect so much. I'm thinking, for example, about um, 
Astiberri uh, editorial, no, located in Bilbao, and you may think that this, uh, the topics uh, may be this ones or those ones, because if it's uh, located in the Basque country, uh, but if you know this uh, publisher, uh, in fact, it publishes in Spanish, Catalan, Basque, Galician, and many other uh, European uh, languages, and it deals with many uh, different topics. So I'm allowed to the, the idea. The paper also says the author is more likely to make comics about the story that it uh, closes to him here. This reminds me a little bit when, when you are, uh, when you want to write, um, let's say, a book or whatever, and a writer tells you, I better write about something you, you know, no? Um, it doesn't necessarily, I think, have to be that way. I think the author is more likely to make comics about the history he or she knows or just wants to read uh, uh, or to, to write or to draw about. No? Personally, and because of my academic and professional background, I know more about the German uh, 20th century history than the Spanish. Oh, wow. Well. Um, and um, uh, one of the greatest experts on the, for example, Spanish Civil War is um, Gibson from Dublin or Paul Preston from Liverpool. So I'm just uh, looking there. The fourth question was how, uh, talking about the format. And I think it's uh, sometimes if you have written, uh, uh, read the, the, the paper of Jacobo, it's more um, uh, reason, uh, purely cultural or even historical. Uh, different countries, different uh, formats. I'm thinking about the European format, the comic book in the US, the manga in Japan, uh, in Brazil. The first question was, who does it? Uh, and yeah, I'm closing just because of that, uh, because the, the sixth one uh, was what, for, and why, which is uh, okay. But the last one, sorry, who does it? Um, the paper said that, uh, they are usually professional historians, and I don't know uh, what about being an author but not an illustrator. Uh, illustrator, sorry, um, my English. Is this double authorship understood? Again, I'm thinking about the collaboration between that Paul Preston with Jose Pablo Garcia, no? And sorry, I'm super sorry. I, I have so many things. No, yeah, sorry. thank you very much. Sorry. That's so really many nice ideas. because this way you have still some material to ask. To use the 20 minutes we have if anyone else doesn't want to share. So I'm giving the word to Jacobo. Jacobo, you have your five minutes. Well, thank you very much for your, your notes. Uh, uh, I'm going to, to what? I'm going to initiate the five minutes response, but maybe it's going to be <laughs> most, of the, most of the time you said. So um, I, I understand that you don't maybe don't understand the, the final objective and the final goal of the, of the purpose of the methodology, because it depends on the, on the researcher. Since you can not only focus on uh, one single comic book, graphic novel, whatever, you can also focus on a, a broad uh, quantity of comics and graphic novels. So you can um, fit your research as, as fit your, 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 your need it. So I think that's, uh, I, I, I'm sorry that I know was I wasn't clear about about the about that. So I I get that I I lack examples on my paper. That's that's true, and I I'm sorry for it as well. I didn't want to 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 put a lot of examples because maybe it would be a, a lot more confusing for anyone who know who is not um, related to to my area of, of knowledge of so the humanities and history sciences. So I think uh, I had to apologize for that. Sorry. And answer your doubts or your question about the, my questions I put on the, on the paper. Well, um, when it was made, you think that uh, you asked me uh, the, the, in democracies there are a, a change about the about the when what is made. Yes. Uh, no. It, it's very important because. And, the, and this is uh, related to um, who does it too, because uh, a, a, a small um, a small company, a small uh, editorial, tends to focus on the local history and the local news to try to sell their products, their goods. So 
they can, um, the, 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 the potential um, reader can relate to what it's going to, to buy, to acquire. So I think that's uh, very, very important because uh, uh, when, when the redactor sheet was, was, was on, um, they tend to focus on the main uh, historical episodes of the heroism, like Numantia, like uh, Hannibal, like, uh, I don't know, uh, El Cid. But when it comes to, to, the, to democracy, we find that there are a lot of new episodes that are uh, being used and reproducing, reproduced for, um, from in, in the comic books, such as, I don't know, um, uh, Irmandillo War, La, La Guerra de los Irmandiños, a Galician uh, episode, or even, uh, I don't know, uh, a local dispute between two novels in the uh, Basque, Basque country. So I think, I, I hope I, I respond that, uh, that, 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 that your doubts about the, the subject. Where? Well, I think, yes, I know, uh, I, I perfectly know Astiver is one of my favorite uh, companies uh, today, but I think that's in part answered uh, before. It's very important because this, this kind of company, this kind of uh, editorial needs to, to sell their goods and they try to separate from the, for the current trends so they can be uh, seen as innovative companies. So uh, I think it's very important where, because uh, most, uh, for example, um, Catalan titles, uh, graphic novel, graf Catalan graphic novels tend to focus only in the historical graphical novels, okay? From the, uh, the historic, uh, the, histor the history theme tends to focus on the Catalan history. Um, and so uh, it's, it, the where is important. The where is important because if it uh, helps you to know a lot of things about the context of creation and the genesis of the creation of the, of the comic book. And attending to, to the how, which we are already finished because I uh, ran out of time. I think the, there is a cultural reason, yes, but the format in Spanish, uh, I'm only referring to the Spanish market, the Spanish history, uh, industry. So I think I did not uh, take on account the other countries because my main focus is on the Spanish subject. And who does it when, when it's not, uh, when an author, that's Paul, uh, Paul Preston is not a, an illustrator, well, they, they just used to, uh, tend to ally with an uh, with a dryer who can draw. So I think that's not um, such an issue. 30 uh, seconds. I just uh, finished already because I'm running out. Thank you. Sorry for my bad English. Thank you very much to both of you. Um, I know there's some things that are still in the air. So, but if someone has a question, please raise your hand and just let it go. No, okay, I guess, uh, yes, Jorge, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, yeah, I'll, I like about your paper, Jacobo, that is, these are reflections. I mean, you're reflecting about different aspects, about the author, about the context, about the when, about the how, about the place of production. I like that approach that um, sometimes in a, in a very formal paper you miss, you know, that kind of um, brainstorming or stream of consciousness, I like that. and. It made me think about the, um, the book by Gillian Rose, Visual Methodologies. It's a fantastic book. And she, uh, in a way, is very much connected to what you are saying because she differentiates about the site of the image, the technical components of an image, the site of production. And then we can talk about places, about the context, the time, and about all these aspects that determine one way or another um, how a comic is produced. And then the side of audiencing. Maybe that side of audiencing, of reception, of how the, the readers make sense of the comic, and that is something that we're gonna find out more with, particularly with Eva and Joe's paper. Um, maybe that part was missing in your reflections about what the audience, you know, the changes in the audience, or how do they make sense of these comics, of these historical comics? And that makes me think about them the new publishers, and I wanted to ask you, what do you think about the new publisher, Cascaborra, who is publishing 
tons of comics, historical comics of every single period in Spain. I mean, why is that happening now? Well, thank you for, for your words, Jorge. Um, I perfectly know Cascaborra. I'm, I'm a subscriber for, for them, for the comics. So I happily receive every month uh, new, new, <laughs> new, new, new numbers. Well, I thinking that they are okay because I, I admire some of the of their their work because I think I think they are they are simply amazing. But also we can find a certain number of I don't want to 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 say a a bad a bad, a bad appreciation of, of their of their effort and their work because they are currently the most uh the remember most, you're being you're being recorded yeah that's why uh that's, they are the most uh, <laughs> i don't know how to say longevo in english but they are the most extended co um, collection of comic books currently on um i have to say in the all on and all all the spanish history comic books they are the most um longest collection yeah and i think that there has to be goods and bad uh, issues with the with the within the, the collection but when it comes to to analyze the the audience well i don't know how to how to put it because it's, it's difficult mostly people are tend to being dragged because of the of the background of, of, the, of the history of, for example the feet of uh, Covadonga, Guadalete, but I think, and this is one of my um, conclusion when I do, I did my PhD, is that they, they want to reread constantly over and over the same themes, but they are now uh, asking for or craving for certain kind of uh, the very same theme that is not lacking the the the, 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 that's um, that's my mythological or legendary part, for example, the feed, but they are already in the same, in the same way that being the most uh, historical, um, the most historical truest, I don't, I don't know how to, how, to, how to say, it. they want to be uh, reading like a, like a history book without reading an actual history book. Uh, but in the same time, uh, do not touch my my idea of the feed, for example. Uh, I hope that I can um, answer your your question. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Someone has a question. Um, Paula, do you want to continue the dialogue? Or... Yes. Can Can you turn your mic? Puedes prender tu mic. Podría hacer una pequeña intervención en español, muy breve. Por favor. Uh, Jacobo, yo he leído la, 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 la participación de Jacobo. Claro, conozco la Universidad de Málaga, que es de donde venimos ambos. Y es que yo creo que él ha tenido que abrir una brecha porque no hay nadie en historia, sobre todo con unos planteamientos muy clásicos. Es una facultad con unos planteamientos muy clásicos, muy de unas temáticas muy troncales. Eh, yo estoy en contemporánea, pero es otra vez la primera, la segunda guerra mundial y tal. Y ellos pues igual, los fenicios, tal, no sé qué. Entonces Jacobo está, haciendo, está en eh, historia antigua y ciencias historiográficas, estamos en departamento diferente, pero la universidad es muy clásica. Entonces no hay estudios culturales, jamás se han hecho estudios culturales de ningún tipo en, en filosofía y letras en Málaga. Entonces yo creo que tanto su tesis como los planteamientos que él tiene metodológicos están un poco influenciados por ese clasicismo y entonces él tiene como que justificar muy bien y amarrar muy bien por qué está haciendo estudios de cómics en historia. Entonces yo creo que eso le condiciona, si no me equivoco, Jacobo, pues es un poco una hipótesis mía. Uh, I was valid the entire PhD. ¿Eh? I was valid the entire PhD. Claro, le, le, le cuesta abrir esa brecha, entonces él está muy concentrado en la justificación metodológica. 
Y en tanto que vosotros, que venís de otras universidades más, más relacionadas con estos temas, ya vais directamente al grano de, 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 de temas concretos. Creo que es un poco ahí el, ese decalage, que no sé cómo se dice ni en francés ni en español, pero ni en inglés ni en español, pero hay como un decalage ahí de, de, que, de que necesita hacer mucha, mucha justificación historiográfica. Creo, no sé, si tiene algo que ver con lo que habéis estado observando. Creo que es por ahí, pero bueno, eso no es con relación al estudio, sino a, al conocimiento que yo tengo de nuestra universidad. ¿Puedo? Sí. Yo, uh, I would like to add to what has been said, that this is very important, because actually at our university in Central Europe, we are still, or generally in our uh, culture, we are still struggling with the concept of comics and graphic novels as, uh, let's say, marginal genres, which are not suitable for academic research. So uh, this uh, way of trying to include it into the debate, academic debate, acceptable for everybody is very important. So uh, in that sense, what, uh, what Deborah has mentioned is very, very important to have it on our mind and then to see how it uh, fulfills the, the goals, the aims of uh, what the um, researcher wants to do. Yeah, thank you. Okay, maybe I would, would just like to add a comment. When I saw, um, Hako, Hako, your que, cuando, como, y donde, whatever. I thought in this W of journalism. So maybe you can also, it's it's a big shot I'm going to, to give to you, but you have big questions, what, when, where. But maybe you can try to make a kind of a typology that will help you to find a methodology. You can think in all kinds of questions, not for every text you are working on, but that kind of way will help you to reach a little bit better and will help you to give us in a few years a methodology <laughs> because we are looking for it. So it's just a, a shot. I'm more work I'm giving to you, but it's it's all. Do you want to answer it or no? Uh, yeah, no, only only to say that that's the, the purpose of my paper here, just to propose a methodological way to treat not only historical comic books but any i think i feel like it can to apply to any graphic novel that, that's why i wanted to to discuss here thank you uh, maybe one last question it's not a question is is uh, more a comment uh, related to the clarifications of our methodology and how to include other studio comics uh in institutions where definitely it's a struggle to open that kind of research because comics are still considered uh not a serious uh topic for academic research and <clears throat> i was thinking about echo and in apocalypticos integrados and how he was talking about how comics are the new um uh, and superheroes are the new epic or mythological characters for uh, modern times, right? So Echo develops the, this sort of way of, and I think it gives you an in, <laughs> uh, if you uh, relate how we build these kind of mythologies and uh, as in classical cultures and how comics are build their own way of reflecting on history and uh, for example how all superheroes are a construction related to uh, uh modern life right and what kind of projections we see in superheroes that allow us to construct certain ideas about a society our ways of living and all that and that is linked uh also to um all these um ways of documenting for example everyday life or uh, how you can read history through these kind of uh, accountings of everyday life and how all that is connected. I was just thinking about it when, when, when you were talking about that. And I, and I think ECHO gives you a very good uh, starting point on how to connect 
all those uh, topics, right? Just, I was just thinking about that. Yeah. Uh, I want to, to, to kind of make a, a response for that because you have to, you have talked about uh, how all super comic, superhero comics reflect the society. Well, I want to, to bring to, to your attention that there is currently on, there is a, a comic book about how the independence of, of Pamplona was achieved uh, in Ecuaritza, El, El Primer Rey Vascón, that uh, reflects not only the ideology that uh, founded the, the comic, but also how it's the current state of the uh, independent movement of the country, Basque uh, Basque country, that put the face of Jose Maria Aznar, uh, the, the, the Spanish ex-president, in the into uh, the the character of the Conde Aznar, who tried to repress the the Eneco Enecoaritza rebellion. So I think it's very important uh, to to consider not only where what this comic created uh, that's in Pamplona but also the times so i think reflect cultural reflection is going to be um, a theme and an, an issue with the comic books uh, no matter the time um, no matter the the, the where is going to to be to be created well, thank you very much um just another general comment. I'm seeing, I'm I have been listening some books, some authors that come and goes. Maybe we can send them all to Jorge and then Jorge can share it. I guess you agree with your faces. So if someone of us has mentioned a book or a name or an author, whatever, please send it to Jorge. Sorry, Jorge. Send it to Jorge. Well, so course, this yeah. way we can, we can also be doing. Uh, Agatha, I'm looking at you for Sotero, uh, where we can construct a better bibliography. Okay, so so let's go to the second one. We're still on time, almost on time. So uh, the second one is going to be um, Pablo Turnes is going to present the paper by Tania Perez, Comics from Cuba and its Diaspora as a Chronicle of the Social Protest of July 11, 21 in the island. Thank you, Pablo. Five minutes, then I'm going to cut you. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so um, thank you. It's always a pleasure to um, uh, comment on Tanya's work. I met her a few years ago and we've been in touch ever since. And she's always, um, her research is always very stimulating. Um, what I'm going to do is just like briefly read uh, a yeah, try to resume your presentation and then I have some comments and questions I will ask you. So um, sorry if this sounds kind of a stiff, but I'm just trying to use my five minutes as much as I can, okay? Uh, so I'm, I'm just going to read this. So um, Tanya's proposal aims to track the uh, social reaction after the events of July 11, 2021, when the government of Cuban President Miguel Díaz-Canel partially crashed massive protests caused by the pandemic, food and medicine shortage, and demand demands for freedom of speech through the work of three Cuban cartoonists. These cartoonists are uh, Gustavo Rodriguez, AKA Garrincha, born in 1962, who lives in Miami, Ale Lausanne, who was born in 1974, who lives in Santiago de Chile, and Irán Hernández Castillo, uh, who was born in 1989, who lives in Havana. On the one hand, Tanya ties the work and the satirical tone of these cartoonists to a long line of graphical political satire dating back to the 19th century when Cuba was still under Spanish rule. On the other hand, she points out the importance of social webs, Facebook in particular, when it comes to the dissemination of satire along users' commentaries and debate. That is to say, social networks became, become a sort of quote unquote democratic arena an alternative to the strong government control of the media. So according to Tanya, these cartoonists, quote unquote, captured the Cuban popular sens sensibility during the process, but also they retrieved it as a symptom of a long lasting discontent with the revolutionary regime. This meant, to, uh, this meant the use of uh, certain resources and topics which are grouped under the concept of costumbrismo. I'm not sure if there's a word in English I, I looked up uh, and, it just, I think it's the same word, right? Costumbrism. 
Um, this is particularly tied to, the, uh, to reproducing Cuban mannerisms, especially when it comes to Cuban slang, as a discursive strategy to counter and subvert the Cuban government's official discourse, aimed to minimize the gravity of the events that were taking place on the island. Tania uses the concept of intertext to analyze the complex level of satire used by these cartoonists. This can be understood as a fight on a symbolic level, but with very real political and legal consequences. One fascinating example comes from the use of the revolutionary motto, Patria o Muerte, Homeland or, homeland or Death, and its more recent counterpart, Patria y Vida, Homeland, homeland and Life. The use of, of one or the other, Stania states, and I quote, indicates which side of the political debate those who use them are on, end quotation. According to this, the Cuban government has found itself on a defensive side of the fight, resorting to media campaigns, official accusation and replies, and the persecution and imprisonment of Cuban citizens. Tanya then proceeds to analyze each of the aforementioned cartoonist style, starting with Garrincha. Garrincha's, style, Garrincha's graphic style is, at least in the examples that Tanya has chosen, almost like sketches. The lines, the lines are never strongly defined as if it was something made in a rush. They also present an interesting effect mixing those simple, seemingly unfinished lines with very dramatic scenes, many of them dealing with the contradictions that divide Cuban society with an emphasis of, on the families affected by such divisions. Garrincha also attacks and mocks the Cuban official communication strategies and the figure of Diaz Canel. Then we have Lausanne's cartoons. Lausanne's style is more colorful, seems to emphasize the contradiction of the Cuban government. For example, supporting the Chileans who were protesting, but at the same time attacking Cubans who were also protest protesting against their government. Lausanne also makes use of anachronism as a way to overlap three different centuries of Cuban history with a very critical retrospective look on it. Finally, we have Iran Fernandez, Hernández Castillo, and if I may, my personal favorite, Hernández Castillo is probably the more experimental of the three, given his, his cartoons a kind of surrealistic vibe with a heavy use of graphic metaphors that are hard to decode if one ignores the intricacies and actuality of Cuban politics and history. Uh, that, that's my time already? Oh, okay, sorry. I mean, I, I'm almost finished. Being the youngest of the three cartoonists and the only one who still lives in Cuba, Hernández Castillo seems to be very direct in his critics against the Cuban government, and furthermore, against the Cuban revolution itself. He represents a generation that grew up during the so-called special period, period especial, after the end of the Soviet Union, when Cuba was isolated and had to face a rapidly, rapidly deteriorating life quality that only catalyzed an already existing discontent. The younger generation never got to uh, know the benefits of the revolution as previous generations had. At the same time, Hernández Castillo did have the opportunity to access a higher education, having studied at the San Alejandro Academy in the specialty of digital art and FAMCA, Spanish acronym from College of Audiovisual Media Art, in the specialty of direction. Still calling the revolution a quote unquote dictatorship means a great difference compared to other generation in a country where some historical figures have gained the status of worldwide legends. As Tania puts it, the use of contemporary satire by Cuban cartoonists, and I quote, signifies the fracture between the official discourse and their slogans and the reality of economic crisis, repression, and lack of basic needs that the Cuban people face in their everyday life, end quotation. Thank you, Pablo. Now you have the, the five minutes for you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I think he, he pretty much uh, summarized uh, my proposal, uh, even with the examples. Um, and um, I don't have almost anything. Yes, pretty much. It's, uh, I, I mean, what I did is I noticed that as the protests were ongoing in Cuba, I was following on Facebook what was going on in the island. And I started to notice that many cartoonists were immediately, at like the same day the protest started, they were publishing through Facebook. And the thing is, even though uh, the internet access was uh, cut in Cuba, people still, still managed to get videos, to get information out. And as they were receiving these, they were responding in, through Facebook. And, and maybe this needs to be 
uh, uh, more uh, uh, Cubans did not have access to internet at all until 2013. You had access when in your place of work where you could access some things, but anything that was not authorized, simply when you try to access it, it says, you know, there's no access. So uh, now that Cubans have access to some sort of uh, internet connection, they are using it very efficiently, I think, to get materials out and to communicate with people around the, uh, outside the island. And this creates these forums, right? Uh, and this never happened before. There was no possibility of having this kind of exchange with, between people in the island and people who are abroad. And that's why I think it's so important to link uh, because it was like a, uh, a declaration, an official declaration and a counter discourse immediately happening. Usually we had to wait years to have this kind of analysis, but the fact that having internet and being able to uh, access not only what the Cuban government says, but what other actors say, it has, it, it, I think is definitely changing the dynamic. For example, when Patria y Vida was out, immediately the Cuban government got a video out talking about Patria Muerte. So it's the first time that this kind of dynamic happens. Usually people were defensive because nobody dared to contradict the main discourse. And now it's the government who is trying to modernize or appeal to uh, more people in response to what they see always as an attack, right? Never uh, a possibility to uh, maybe, you know, um, debate ideas. No, it's always seen as an attack. And they are on the and they are uh, mostly on the defense, like they don't acknowledge that this kind of massive change has happened, but they do try to respond always. So it is a very interesting change in dynamics. So thank you so much. You did a great job, <laughs> pretty much summarizing what I said. Um, I have some comments and maybe questions. Sure. I trust, yes. If, if I may. Okay, so let's begin discussion. Okay. Uh, yeah, one, one of the first things I noticed because it's like uh, right at the start is like the use of the uh, word freedom, which is always a, a catchy uh, term, but so also a tricky one. Uh, so I, I was interested in knowing when you said demands for freedom or more freedom, what does that mean exactly for, for Cuban protesters? Um, then you mentioned something about this, um, how to deal with trauma and everyday life at the same time, so how, how traumatic things don't happen outside everyday life. It's, it's all, all uh, intertwined. And uh, I was thinking about, of course, uh, Rothbard and his uh, traumatic realism, which is maybe not exactly um, uh, meant, you know, it, I don't think that'd be applied in total, like especially for cartoons, but there's something about it, right? Like producing this kind of narratives while at the same time they uh, things are, are happening, um, and then um, I was thinking about this um, relationship to the 19th century satire. So uh, I wanted to ask you if you think is there a kind of a genealogy? I don't know. I'm not sure if that's the right term, but let's you know that's a genealogy of counter discursive true satire that can be tracked in human history. I mean, of course, started with the Spanish rule, right? But uh, through 20th uh, and, and the 33rd century. Um, and I also uh, wanted to ask you if do social networks somehow act as newspaper and printing magazines used to in the previous century? Because that's like a very big difference there. Um, and uh, well, then, then I just, I don't know, if maybe I, I might repeat myself, but I, I was very interested in this. Um, difference between these uh, three cartoonists who belong to three different generations marked by very uh, important, I mean, yeah, all of the, uh, the revolutionary time span is important, but you know, one born in the 60s, one born in the 70s, and one born in the late 1980s, 
And also, you know, about I uh, wanted to ask you about this the, the production production context. You know, one is doing physical tunes from Miami, which is in itself very significant. The other from Chile, but there's one who's uh, doing it from Havana, so he's in Cuba itself. That, that, that's interesting. So how does that affect their production? If, if you have yeah. any uh, idea, and um, uh, oh, the other is like more conceptual thing. But you uh, speak of them about historietistas, which is like kind of hard to um, translate. Usually in English, you just say cartoonists. And it's the same thing for someone who is making comics or just you know uh, cartoons, like one frame cartoons or a few. Uh, and why not use humorista graficos, like uh, graphic uh, humorist? Is there? Uh, do you think there's a difference be between someone who makes comics and someone who makes uh, cartoons or historietista and humorista? Um, and then um, I, I found a, a very interesting. You say uh, uh, I'm quoting Tanya here. I am interested in including creators both from the island and its diaspora, since they coexist the transnational virtual space provided by virtual space and articulate a sequential narrative that records the events of the island from the popular medium that is the comic. And I thought that it was a very interesting point, uh, the way social networks can somehow allow the convergence of people who have been separated by exile. Uh, but however, this doesn't mean there's an equality of conditions in these virtual meetings, right? Like uh, we, we can debate or exchange ideas in Facebook, Facebook but it doesn't mean that there's necessarily uh, an horizontal position or a transversal position to that. Um, um, then something about the birth of the cartoon, I already mentioned that. Um, uh, well, uh, one of the, uh, I, I don't know if you have images, sorry, I'm just commenting here, but if you uh, go to uh, Tanya's text and uh, one of the um, the Garrincha's uh, cartoons, this woman uh, with a candle in the hand looking at on the coast, looking at the sea, uh, I, I thought that, that that was a very complex uh, cartoon um, because the use of the uh, Phrygian gap. The Frisian cup is this uh, symbol of the of republicanism, which was very important for Latin America countries in the 19th century. And this, uh, and it's like the, the, the figure uh, also is shown like uh, on, the, on the background. So this, like this double appearance of the same character, uh, is it the same character? Does it represent the Republic? And how's that, that relates to the opposition to the revolutionary government? Um, let me see. Um, also, uh, yeah, um, you use the word uh, um, in one of the uh, Lausanne's uh, cartoons, uh, there are two women speaking and one of them uh, tells the other, all I want is for my son to come home. He's disappeared since the protest started. So I thought, uh, you know, how does this heavily charged thing, Desaparecido, works in Cuba, especially having in mind what that works means in most Latin American countries. And, um, oh yeah, and uh, the, uh, this whole uh, thing of the, uh, what you call the proper La Habana, the, the, the way people speak some slang. And, and I believe that also it's interesting that this is something comic strips and cartoons have tradition and work with, with, with the slang of the common. When mm -hmm. you go to the yellow kid, you can see, you know, and uh, all of those uh, early 20th century, but also in Latin America. So can we think, of it as a part of the comical effect, but also in time of some kind of archive of popular culture. Um, uh, well, then you say something about the 19th century, but I, I, I'm not getting into that. Uh, just let me see if I have something more. Uh, Maybe Pablo then I wants to say something. No, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm sorry, I, I just- I'm taking you know, notes of yeah. everything mm -hmm. you are asking. So to answer in the same order that you are asking them, so uh, no, it just um, no. I mean, uh, one just suggestions, uh, and, and this is, I will finish with this. You know, otherwise, it's just too much. Um, but uh, other, or we can talk. We can about, also, yeah, talk, yeah. you know, informally later. Uh, but I was talking about uh, you say, and I quote: the new generations of Cuban Cuban children no longer look at the future of the island as a promise of 
an egalitarian just society, but they hoped for the end of the dictatorship represented by President Miguel Díaz-Canel and his quote unquote government of continuity. And I was thinking about uh, this uh, Mark, uh, Mark Angino uh, idea of doc, concept of doxa for the limits of the unspeakable and the unspeakable during a certain historical time. So a uh, dictatorship was always an anti-castrist or anti-castro, anti-communist epithet that could be understood as hypocrisy. Other, other anti-communist dictatorship were not seen as such by that same discourse, right? But uh, what change, changes here is the fact that the Cuban people themselves not only perceive it as such, but explicitly point it out in this way. So that's you know, the use of the word dictatorship here, like the use of the word freedom, right? Uh, so, okay, I'm going to shut my mouth now. Is, has anyone a comment or a question, you, Jorge? Uh, it's, it's a very brief question um, about methodology. Why do you use Tania? those um, examples coming from Facebook, um, because there were maybe other options, well, Instagram, Twitter, that was one question. And then another one, if this, particularly Hernandez Castillo, which I found really interesting about the conceptual metaphors that as well Roberto will, will be talking about, his examples were really poignant and, and interesting. Um, have you follow up if there were some consequences for the artist? Because he's the one who is living in Cuba. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, so, um, why I, why I uh, chose Facebook? I chose Facebook because it's the is the the place that Cubans can access that they have recently been able to access, and and also because the Cubans who are outside use the same the same medium. So I chose it because it's something in common in the island and abroad, and it's because it's a new. Uh, medium that people in the island didn't have access to before. So what's happening uh, is that people in the island uh, look at Facebook to find out uh, about news that they don't have access to in Cuba. So it, it so they Facebook uh, in, in practical terms is now sort of where they go to find the answers that they don't find through the national uh, news or in newspapers, uh, because there is no other way for them to access it. There is no CNN. There is no the only that they have the only news that you have in Cuba is the approved uh, press, written press, and, and the news, and all of that is that's it. That's what you have available. So people look at Facebook as an alternative way of finding out, you know. People say what actually happened. That's what they say in the island. I want to know what actually happened, and they go to Facebook, right? And that's why I chose it. Um, and your other question was: If you follow up with Hernandez Castillo, if there were I any do, consequences of him publishing all this material, I do follow up with him through Facebook, <laughs> through Facebook Messenger, uh, through private uh, messaging, and. He, he um, told me that definitely he has received like warnings, warnings. That, that's how it starts. They give you a warning. You are like kind of be doing too much. Maybe you should just nap, you know. Uh, that's all that's happened so far. He has received these uh, uh, warnings, uh, but also what Cuban people have learned to do is to be very careful uh, in who they accept as friends. And they uh, very carefully also uh, go to settings and they restrict who can see what they, are, what they are doing. That's one of the things that finally they can do. So he told me, I am very careful because what's happening also in all this Facebook thing is that you have people employed by the government to function as a, a counter answer to whatever that's not like uh, by the official discourse. And actually people call them cyber clarias. Uh, clarias are these, these, these invasive species that the Cuban government found to the uh, food crisis in the island. 
Uh, they're ugly, people don't like them, but they eat them because there's nothing else. So these, these bots by the government, people call them cyber clarias, right? So, so you have actually, what happens is that Facebook has become for Cubans in the island and abroad, this battlefield of ideology and politics and information. And that's why I also chose it, right? Uh, so, so pretty much I do the same. When I want to see what people are saying in the island, I go to these uh, official pages and then I compare it with what people are saying. So, um, so uh, regarding your question about freedom, um, Cubans, one of the ideas that they have about freedom is related to normalcy. They are very aware that they don't have a normal life in Cuba because there's a lot of things that they cannot do. Uh, I cannot just get a passport and go out. I cannot uh, say anything uh, to criticize because then I will get the security forces knocking on my door. So what they understand as normal is also idealized, right? They think that once you leave Cuba, everything will be great, everything will be solved. So this idea of normalcy is very debatable. And one of the meanings of freedom is I want to be able to work like in other place, make money like in any other place, uh, be able to travel if I want to. I want to be able to have a salary that allows me to live a normal life without having to steal. So the idea, the connection between freedom and normalcy, it's, it's, it's a lot what people are asking. Now, you have, for example, in Miami, uh, of course, is like uh, the, the official discourse in Cuba, but in reverse. Uh, there's nothing positive. Everything is, it, it's, it's pretty much, it has been a madman mad man conversation since 1959 until today. And there is no doubt that by isolating Cubans until like the 1980s, uh, the government itself is giving people this suspicious about everything because when people don't know what's true and what's not, and they have to find out what's actually going on by alternative me means, then anything that you can say might be true. And that's what's happening right now, right? Uh, so also that freedom means I want to be able to read whatever I want. I want to be able to choose what I listen to. So that's pretty much one aspiration, normalcy. We want to be normal like everyone else, even though they don't have a very clear idea of what to be normal means, right? Um, regarding trauma and everyday life, the problem um, with, uh, in, in, in Cuban society is that everybody knows very well what you can say publicly and what you just want to say to your very close friends. Do you know, for example, that in every office there is somebody informing about what you say. So you have to be very careful in what you say in public because you don't know who's listening and who's going to inform. And that uh, is a, it, it creates a sort of this schizophrenia in which everybody in private tells you, this is crazy, blah, blah, blah. But then when you get to the party meetings, yeah, the revolution believes. Uh, so it, it, it's, it's a fracture between how you live in your mind and what you say out loud. Uh, and that's why I talk about trauma and everyday life. Because when you go to a newspaper, everything is going great. <laughs> everything is great. There's food everywhere. Everything is fine. And you know, because you live that life there, that is not true. So, and it's been going on like this for 60 years. So it is not that people are not aware. I think it's an inherited trauma too, because we have been living like that for all those years. And previous generations are uh, facing the same problems that somebody like uh, Iran, who was born in 1989 is facing, right? Uh, so people are aware 
that this has been going on for a long time. And, and practices and everyday life in Cuba is all about surviving. It's pretty much about surviving. Um, so, and, and, but every day that you live, and I experienced it when I was there, I worked at Casa de las Americas, which is one of the revolution's cultural black institutions, right? And I knew very well what I could say and what I couldn't, and I know how it works. And yes, it's, it's something that you have to learn to live with. And uh, what I think is happening lately in these last years is like people simply are, co are becoming completely um, distanced from whatever the government says. They don't care. In my generation, yes, it mattered because you were conflicted between I want to be a revolutionary. I want to be on the right side, but this doesn't make sense. People right now don't, don't even pose that question anymore. And when you look at the numbers in the la in the last months, and you realize that more la that the number of Cubans who have left the island in the last few months is already more than they lived in the Maria Exodus in just a few months. There are practically no young people in Cuba. Everybody who's there is because it's all has a disability and doesn't have the means to live because everyone else is living. Um, so the satire definitely um, in the 19th century when we were uh, had in the, our independence war, uh, of course, the Spaniards were depicted uh, through satire and they were always clumsy, stupid uh, and just if you look at uh, Elpidio Valdez, our national hero in cartoons, and you compare it to the, the, Spanish, the Spanish general, it's, it's completely, uh, uh, it, 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 it's satire. It's always, it's mocking pretty much the, the colonial power in Cuba. And when uh, Lausanne establishes a connection between the Cuban president and that uh, colonial Spanish general, that's saying a lot, right? That is, that is establishing an historical connection between somebody who should be working for the government of the Cuban citizen, but is actually working against them. Um, and I see, for example, uh, in the 1930s, when we were through the Machado dictatorship, El Bobo was a very uh, popular character who criticized the government pretending to not understand. And sometimes, or very often, these cartoonists are doing something similar. I only included specific days in, in my proposal because this is going on still, but I had, of course, to have a limit, right, for how much material I, I included. So I, I collected everything for more like, like a month, but I'm only using the first week, I think, in, in my proposal because I, this is, I, I said, well, this is enough. So people can appreciate what was going on. Sorry, um, Tania. Uh, so was, that's it. There was another question, maybe a last question. Um, yes, um, I really enjoyed uh, your presentation and the presentation of the paper. And just jumping on what Jorge was asking about uh, consequences and your comment about the space the interesting space that Facebook creates. I was thinking a little bit about the distribution that happens. Does the conversation that happened remain part of people involved in uh, being connected to Cuba or being interested or do the artists also think about how their work is shared? So I was thinking a little bit more about uh, somebody's work like Lalo Alcaraz, right? Mm. That he constantly is saying, please distribute this, please take it out, please, you know, use my work, right? So do these artists do something like that or the social media work in a way that this kind of work can be communicated or not? Yes, definitely. Facebook is also a way for them to make people aware of what they are doing. Mm. And when I contacted the three of them to ask permission to use their images, they all know about each other. They follow each other. They know what they are doing. And for example, Iran told me, it's an honor for me that you are including me with Garrincha and with uh, Lausanne because they were my heroes, right? I grew up 
looking at what they were doing. So definitely, yes, they are using Facebook not only at a, as a platform to express all these opinions, but also it's the only way that they have to see their works published. Not in the case of Iran. And I think Iran is very smart in how, because you have to negotiate because in Cuba, you don't have private work and you have to work for the government. And because you have to work for the government, you need to be very careful in this equilibrium between what you say and how. And I just found out that he published his first book in Cuba. I tried to get it to my family in Cuba and it was sold, sold out. It was sold out. So uh, how people know how, it means that there is all this uh, under <laughs> network of people who follow him, who know about him, and who actually tell him, hey, be careful. Hey, this, this, this can get you in trouble. So definitely, yes, it, it's all of that. Uh, it's the other way in which they aspire to be normal, right? That's part of that idealized normalcy that they want to, to have, right? Okay. okay. Uh, sorry, I have That's to it. cut you because I'm going to give you the word again because <laughs> you're going to present uh, Pablo's uh, text. Uh, so you're going to present um, Pablo Torne's text about uh, traces of memory, the restrictive dimension of drawing in South America. Tania, five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Tania. Uh, Those are the ones by Cosio, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so um, I'm now going to uh, present uh, Pablo's work uh, and his proposal uh, title is Traces of Memory, the Restitutive Dimension of Drawing in South America. Uh, and I am going to uh, read a little bit of uh, summarize his proposal. Uh, during the first decades of the 21st century, the retrieval of graphic production produced under imprisonment situations, as well as the use of drawing as a way to make present those who were killed and disappeared or buried in mass graves during times of extreme political violence, present a challenge to both memory and comic studies. Um, and Pablo says that he wants to re reinterpret the use of drawing held traditionally by art history as a subsidiary process to painting as part of an ongoing process to rematerialization of memory through an underscore and usually overlooked tool in memory studies. Uh, it was, uh, for me, it was really um, um, in, in sync to what I was trying to do, how he poses the question of how to look at the use of uh, drawing and as sequential art to make visible what is invisible, the very bodies, those memories, and how those materialize uh, that experience of disappearance. So when there is an, an empty space, you have uh, the faces and the testimonies of people who were uh, in prison. Um, so this idea of rematerialization and how the materiality of drawings brings something to uh, life, I think, is one of the concepts that I, I was more 
uh, interested in what uh, you wrote. Also, he is a uh, very, um, uh, I think it, it was a great connection between studies of memory, comic theory, and art history. So he is uh, definitely asking questions that we need to be asking on how we look at comics as, as something that it's uh, used in the case, for example, of uh, Jesus Cosillo, a, Peru, a Peruvian uh, comic artist. Uh, he goes to the communities and he gives these workshops and he, as you can see in here, he pretty much brings back the faces of the uh, relative who disappear and through the work with the community, he gives them pretty much puts a face to those people who are no longer present. And actually it's also, uh, I, I like how uh, Pablo talks about the cathartic uh, power of these kind of uh, drawings, memories, and how it, it serves to connect, right? For example, uh, the relative of who are living to their disease uh, low, uh, loved ones. Uh, and that dimension that is not just historical, but to sentimental, right? How you connect these kind of uh, instances through drawing. I uh, definitely value that reflection in Pablo's uh, work. And uh, one of the other very interesting questions that he asked in his proposal is, why use comics as a medium for the reconstruction of memory? Why not use photography? What, uh, well, uh, in some of the examples is because I, pretty much the, they didn't have any photographic material left. And on the other hand, because precisely through drawing and these workshops, he is creating this cathartic experience uh, with people. So that uh, act of uh, drawing and reconstructing also have a, a cathartic dimension. Uh, in the case of Cosillo, you can see, for example, the testimonial dimension of prisoners or, uh, during the Argentine dictatorship and the Chilean dictatorship. And those are coming to life in, as Pablo said, the first years of the 21st century. And I immediately saw it's uh, amazing how we are seeing in the, in this first, in this, two first uh, decades of this new century, how uh, memory about our very <laughs> conflictive 20th century are being drawn and told. It's happening uh, also in Cuba. People are starting to get out graphic novels about their experiences of exile and in the revolution. And it's through comics and through uh, graphic novels. Uh, so we are, Pablo is talking about the value of the drawings of the prisoners, but also about bringing back the disappear and how the comic as a medium, as you were saying, who has been traditionally marginalized, have this power to make, uh, to make history, to make testimonies, to make available uh, faces that otherwise would be lost. Um, Something else uh, sorry, sorry, that it's um, interesting in what he says. <laughs> She's ignoring me. Sorry. That's it? Yeah, that's it. Well, sorry, pretty sorry. much. You, you will have enough time later. But it's it's amazing. Uh, I, I really enjoyed um, what, he, uh, what he did. Um, I, I have uh, time for questions. After we, we'll have the discussion. So now okay. we have, Pablo has five minutes to answer. OK. Um, Um, well, uh, it's interesting to use the word cathartic. It's not a word I use, but it's not a part of it, but I think it's. Perdonad, pero no se escucha. Ah, sí, el botoncito. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm an old man. I, I don't know how to use technology these days. Um, I was, uh, yeah, you use the word cathartic, which is not a, a term I use. I think it's part of it, yeah, sure. Uh, but I, it's um, one of the things that uh, these uh, kind of, uh, I, I made up a word, neologism. There's no uh, restitutivo, the restitutive is, is, is not a word, officially speaking. Uh, 
I actually have a comment about that later. Okay, um, it's a, because I wanted some um, feedback on that. Um, and uh, a word that is used is reparation, which is a legal uh, word, uh, because it's all of this is usually related one way or another to um, legal processes, which uh, I mean, coming from Argentina, Argentina is kind of an exception because there was a, a very quick trial to the main responsibles of the dictatorship, like uh, in the dictatorship ended in 1983 and by 1985, they were being tried. And that set an example where, of course, it happens what it usually happens. Then you have like, you know, uh, uh, going back and forward with that, uh, but usually in most countries, especially in Latin America, but you know, uh, uh, in, in other countries of the world too, um, there was no such process by trial. Uh, there were these so-called transitional periods, and you have like you know, but Chile is like one of the uh, great examples of this. You know that that is exactly what the, the Argentine uh, military wanted to do. They just wanted to set the terms on which the transition will be performed, which was basically um, making sure they were not accountable for what they had done. Um, so uh, part of my hypothesis, uh, which is of course a work in progress, uh, is that the fact that suddenly we have like in the last 15 years. Uh, give or take, um, we have all of these graphic novels and comics and drawings being used in this way. It's, uh, it's that, well, you know, the, it's tied to new generations. Uh, it's tied to the way that drawing is used uh, and comics are used as an expressive form rather than a commercial one. And also it's a way that uh, a kind of proof that memory cannot be buried uh, permanently. You know? So uh, one way or another, it just, just uh, emerges once again. And, um, but it's interesting also that the state is never uh, separated from these processes. It's, it's part of it, like in Peru, this is part of the uh, so-called um, uh, National Commission for Truth and Reconciliation, if I'm not wrong. And that is another, very strong word, reconciliation and forgiveness. Uh, it, and it works differently from country to country. Uh, in, in Argentina, that is unacceptable for human rights organization because for example, the, the, the ones who always speak about reconciliation and forgiveness is the Catholic church because they were like really into the dictatorship. They were uh, morals and, and, and material supporters of that. But in, in, in Colombia, for example, uh, in the, I think it's in the, in the region of uh, the Montes de Maria. Uh, there's, um, uh, it has to do with ethnic differences between some uh, uh, people, native people who live there. And they call, in their culture speaking, they cannot um, deny forgiveness. So how do you make that work with people who have tortured and killed and basically destroyed your communities. So it's very strong, the, they meet and they talk face to face. So the idea is to somehow make that, uh, you know, like kind of solve the thing. But in all of these processes, there's something that is always unsolvable because there's the only way to really solve this is to bring back that and you can do that. So that's, so uh, you have to basically uh, try other strategies. So this is where drawing and, and narratives, you might call it generally speaking, and graphic narratives comes in. And then I give some, well, okay, I send some examples I can comment on that later. And uh, I, in the last images I, I included, them. I, they are not mentioned in the text, but they are part of a graphic novel published last year in Argentina by- um, 30 seconds. Yeah, by, by an artist whose father was disappeared. And it's very interesting the way, she, I mean, I can comment on that later, but uh, now I'm, I'm all yours. Well, thank you very much, Pablo. Um, if someone wants to add something, uh, maybe Jorge before Tania is. Thank you, thanks. Um, yeah, I love your paper, Pablo. And it's, it made me think about um, one thing in particular, like the value of drawing, vis-a-vis -vis photography. Yeah. 
what do you get when you draw, what you don't get with the photography. I mean, why in the communities, you know, having the drawing of the relative who was um, killed, you know, has a special value um, in relation to having a photograph of that same relative that they, I'm sure they have several, okay? And it made me think of a work of a comic that is Threats by Kate Evans, who traveled to Calais, to the jungle. Mm -hmm. And then she was engaging with the communities there, living in these very difficult conditions. And nobody wanted to be photographed because I was too invasive. And that was, no, they, they just denied that possibility. But they were all um, accepting the possibility of drawing. So if she was there drawing them, and then at the end of the process, if she was giving them the drawing, everything was fine. It, it, was, it was a more intimate relation uh, that you don't get perhaps with, uh, with a camera. And that made me think about you know, the value that you are trying to unpack about catharsis, as Tanya was saying, or uh, the value of drawing in itself. You know, what can we get out of drawing, which is a primary thing in human being. We all draw, we all drew when we were kids. Some of us continue drawing with no um, skill whatsoever. Others develop into artists, but it's a primary thing that we all have since we were born in a way. So it made me think about that. And, um, and yeah, no, I, 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 love the, I love the paper. And also thinking about the, those examples of drawings uh, in, in those penitentiaries, in those um, torture centers, you know, uh, that material as, as uh, the importance of that actual material of documenting those facts in relation to those comics that were published during the dictatorship in Argentina, such as the one of Las Puertitas del Señor uh, Pérez, who passed censorship, who were published, and some of them were incredibly critical with the dictatorship, but because they were comics, because of maybe problems of legitimization, because they were in the end popular culture, so unimportant, nobody would read them, nobody would care, they passed the censorship. And if we read them today, it's incredible what they were publishing. So combining those two, it makes a really powerful statement about what happened in Argentina or in other places. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it, no, no, it's, it's working this time. Yeah. Um, yeah, about drawing. Yes, there's, uh, well, uh, Hilary Chute, she uh, quotes Bassan very briefly, the uh, French um, cinema critic, uh, film critic, and um, Bassan said that. After, uh, during World War II, or during these years, or in, in the immediate post-war, um, there was such a saturation of photography that some people resorted back to drawing. And what's interesting in drawing is that, yeah, I think, um, I wouldn't say it's not as mediated as photography, but I think that photography is much more explicit. You have a camera right in front of your face, right? It's not the same as drawing. I mean, that is mediated too. There's always some kind of technology, uh, but it's always a, a, a performative act. And I think it's, um, the way people, I mean, you need, first of all, you need more time than to take picture. And that means that usually you spend more time with people. And usually when you spend more time with people, uh, you know, you, you are talking or you're just, you know, being part of their, their everyday life. So I understand why, why this is different, but also uh, I think uh, it's a very on point uh, observation by Didier Schumann. And there's something that actually Chutes also, also goes back to, which is like drawing has traditionally been ignored or discarded as a, a testimonial form, a source, sorry. And, um, but it has to do with urgency. And that is one of the things I, I, I ask uh, myself in, in this uh, presentation, uh, because now looking back, we can say this is drawing, this is comic, or it can be read as such. But it wasn't necessarily thought of that when it was produced. It was produced under uh, very uh, harsh uh, conditions. And basically the idea was, and it's interesting to read the uh, testimonies of Chilean political prisoners. They, most of them say, well, I uh, started drawing 
just to kill time because I was in jail. And then I quickly realized that this is part of a testimony and I need to create this so one day or, or just, just to traffic that uh, out of the prison. So people will know that this happened. And uh, I think that is always, you know, the core of the, of the issue, you know, to let them know that this happened, which is like basically every testimony from survivors or even those who didn't survive left testimonies in, in extermination processes. Okay, uh, first uh, Joe and then Eva and then Tanya, sorry. Um, yeah, thank you. So I enjoyed this paper too. And um, actually your questions about um, essentially what does it mean that it's drawing instead of being photography, which is turning out to be a really piquant way of talking about it, reminded me of um, one of the main things that I, would, I wanted to ask you about. It, it's a methodological question and I'm going to ask you what you think about this approach and your answer may be, I think it's not useful and that would be totally fine with me. Um, the way that, that you've been talking about drawings and memories so far is materialized and, and Tanya used that word and you use your word, use that word in the paper, but it's, um, but it's also very discursive by which it, I mean, it has to do with non-tangible things and it rarely has to do with bodies. And I'm wondering if you think there would be any usefulness to bringing a, a sense of uh, embodiment to the analysis. So for example, um, I'm thinking about the physical acts that are necessary for the creation of comics. So obviously I wonder about the implications of physically drawing something mm -hmm. and what that has to do with, with remembering something. But I'm also thinking about more formalist things like the location of a small image on a large page. And this is Grunstein, right? That where it is on the page helps us remember it and connect it to other images on other pages or the act of turning the page. That's, a, that's an embodied physical act that has something to do with how we remember things too. So I'm wondering, do you, and again, the answer may be no, do you think that there's any potential in thinking about uh, embodied interaction with comics and memory in these cases specifically? Well, it's, that's a, actually a very good question. I'm not sure I have a very good answer or uh, just a, a good answer period, but uh, I try. Um, I mean, yeah, it's very important what, you, what you're suggesting. Uh, it's definitely, I mean, I do mention this, like uh, sometimes it's hard to reconstruct the production context in some of these um, uh, cases, like where did you get the paper, for example? How did you know, uh, how did you uh, manage to was escape the uh, prison, uh, the um, guards watch, or, uh, you know, it, it all depends on the case. Uh, and how did you get that out of the prison, et cetera. That, that, that's a story in itself. But then you have like uh, people doing comics, like in a more, uh, more or less uh, regular formal way. And um, that also, I mean, usually it's like, they are done in, in, in a pretty much standard way, but in the case of uh, Maria Schufra, which are the last images in the, in the PowerPoint, um, she, uh, what she did, she, um, she's connected to other um, sons and uh, daughters who are, uh, went through traumatic experience because their parents or their father or their mother would disappear and they, were, they witnessed that. And so what she did was she traveled through Argentina uh, into different provinces, which is interesting because it's a very centralized uh, country in Buenos Aires. So she went out of there and she, what she did was uh, she wouldn't interview them. She would just let them talk. She wouldn't uh, make eye contact while they were talking and she would just start drawing and taking notes and they could stop at any time they want. So what she captured then, that was it. And of course there's at the same time, since she studied visual arts, uh, you can see that for example, that last, last panel, 
uh, it adds an actual reference to the uh, to a painting. If you can, we can go to the next image. You can see, which is that painting, as a uh, in the late. 19th century in, in, in Argentina. Uh, and also, if you go to the next image, it's clearly that she's reproducing Goya's uh, painting. Uh, so there's, on the one hand, you have this, uh, how that is made at first, but then you have like uh, a process after that. So it's always kind of tricky to realize, I mean, what do you call about embodiment? Yes, body is always, of course, um, involved, but then you have like a creative process which needs some kind of uh, refining, let's say. So uh, this is the big difference between something that is thought of as a graphic novel and it's meant to be published and it's meant to be circulate and be distributed and those other examples which were basically surviving the, an extermination process. And they had no assurance that they, what they could make. I, 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 said, I probably didn't answer your question, but I was thinking about also about, uh, maybe, I don't know if I mentioned this time or not, uh, these, uh, the idea of gap, Scott McLeod's gap. And I think this is an interesting way of reinterpreting that because McLeod's is meant to, uh, you know, like you feel it in the gap, so it makes sense. And this is meant to be presented as a gap that cannot be filled. It's meant to uh, remain empty in a more, if, if you want to go uh, to a more uh, formalist per perspective, but I think it's important and I do take that into account. No, give up um, then Tania. I don't know how much time we have, but a bit picking up on what uh, Joe said, I was wondering whether you, whether you had considered using Philippe Marion's term graphiation. Mm -hmm. um, seeing a page like that really uh, and then thinking about the sketches that prison has made made in prison and his idea that the less mediated an image is the closer we are to that experience i think that could be useful maybe uh, uh in, yes uh, uh, um, i'm sure you thought about that no no uh, uh, yeah the term uh Raffiacion by philippe marion has um yes it's, i think it, it's interesting to think about that, uh, especially when it comes to, uh, and, and there are some, uh, if you can go back to the image, I'm sorry, I, I just, uh, you just keep going back and, I, and tell you, I found, I mean, just by chance, serendipity, uh, that one, that, uh, yeah, that one is by uh, Lelia Bicoca, who, who was uh, disappeared. And, uh, and it's interesting because you will usually find these images in uh, kind of a photocopy way in internet on the internet. But if you, this is like a picture of the original and you can see the materiality of it, how, how fragile it actually is. But it's interesting, she uses like this skeleton and this very, because she, she, she wasn't a professional artist or anything like that. Uh, and I found out that it's very similar to what, if you go back, some other images, uh, not that, not that, yeah. If you see the one that's uh, on your right, from, uh, you know, this was made in the, in the 40s in this concentration camp. It's very, very similar to what Bicoca uh, did. Like this kind of very simple figure that is all, all, also using crutches for different reasons. But, you know, the, the similar, I mean, I found the similarity, similarity striking. Maybe just ends there. It's, just not, it's not necessarily something important, but it's interesting that this, uh, there's not just, I mean, what you call, uh, going back to Marion, uh, Raffiacion uh, concept, but also like some uh, tropes that suddenly you, you find repeated in very different experience through time. I mean, we're talking about like 30 years uh, of distance between one thing and the other, and in very different conditions, it's still very harsh conditions. Uh, so that is a question, and I don't have to, a true answer, but you know, the, the, there's some uh, you might call it graphic strategies when it comes to this, so that you might find repeated in very different contexts. And then these tropes mainly are related to what you were trying to say about comicity and comicality. Yeah, that's uh, Colin Beinecke's, uh Yeah, the I think it's interesting on, on 
on why would they read this as, as comics? You know, they, they were not necessarily thought of that way. Maybe they were, I mean, maybe they were looking for some kind of a narrative, but it's interesting that they found, uh, you know, to uh, perform or just, yeah, to, to make the narrative work, they use uh, sequentiality, which is not necessarily like clear in a very logical way, but still it's there. Um, please, one minute and one minute. Yeah, I will be very brief, yeah. Sorry. So I use catastic because I remember Jesus Cosio using that word uh -huh. uh, when we met in Seattle and he was talking yeah. about the workshops and he used the word catastic. And I remember that, um, how he was explaining that it was catastic for him and for the people in the community. And very quickly, um, we can talk later, but when I was reading about the, uh, your restitution, restituent, all mm -hmm. that, I thought that maybe it would be good to, to take a look at uh, a book by Svetlana Boim that is called The Future of Nostalgia, because she classifies uh, reconstitutive nostalgia and reflective nostalgia. And for example, she says restorative nostalgia puts emphasis on nostos and proposes to rebuild the lost home and patch up the memory gaps. And I thought it's definitely related to what you're talking about mm. uh, with um, the work with memory. So that's it. I, I will pass you the, the, okay. the data later. Yep. Okay, so uh, just a comment. I know it's not South America, but uh, recently there's a comic published in Mexico about the death of the 43 students and the name is Vivos los queremos, yeah. it's a part of the slogan. So I'm going to share also the, the, the data with Jorge. So let's go to the last discussion of this morning. Uh, Jacob Hernando is going to present Los Espacios Imaginarios en Lope de Aguirre de Felipe Hernández Cava, Enrique, Enrique Brecchia, Federico del Barrio y Richard Castells by, uh, por Martín Juaristi Garamendi. I or guess and, Martin is still there. Yeah. Well, I have to say that the paper submitted by Martin, it was very interesting to me uh, and well, I'm very interesting one to read. Not only because it brought me memories of my past self, but because it gave me another way to read and understand a graphic novel that I did have previously working, working on for my PhD. Hernández Cava trilogy, López de Aguirre, is one of those rare examples uh, of a story, uh, a comic story that received sequel, such a trade. The last 20 years of the Spanish 20th century uh, are indeed very, very interesting for all the graphic experimentation authors did within Spanish history genre. And that it's a shame that it was abandoned in the, in the late 90s for most of the new historical genre uh, authors but this is not applied for historical memory in case anyone is going to be picky. Published initially within the Imágenes de la Historia series, but ultimately um, uh, ended with another publisher. Um, Lope de Aguirre has a very interesting graphic development since like Martin has appointed, and in case no other one here is um, uh, known or is common knowledge for, for them, uh, there were three different uh, different illustrators working separately, separately on their each part. Martin understands that this graphic difference is the evolution of uh, Lopez's point of view as the story unfolds. I do not entirely agree with him, but I think this is something of personal opinion and perception of the story, since I, since I think that this was the intention of Cava to illustrate the, the composition of the morals that guide the Spanish rebels. What I want to ask Martin is that, what do you think about the use of color? I think the color black has a deep meaning in, in the sequel, La Conjura, since betray and murder are the main thing happening around the expedition. And also I want to ask Martin about the transformation of the way the language, the text is presented changing and being diminished in some way that at the end, there are no bubbles, but uh, simply words floating in the vignettes. I really uh, appreciate Martin taking account of how this trilogy is related to other media and not only other graphic novels. The transmedia relationship is a thing that I consider very important, especially these modern times when internet, as it has been appointed before here, is universal, universally used. 
And I think I don't have any more to say about the, the paper by, submitted by Martin. And I hope he can uh, answer these two questions I had to, for him. Well, uh, thank you very much, Jacobo. Uh, I basically I would like to ask permission for sharing uh, my screen because I, I prepared a, a few slides to make uh, to share some images and make my points a bit more clear. Okay, so uh, I think I'm not able to to share the screen with uh, right now. Just just a sec, Martin. Okay, thank you. And. Um... You should be able to to show your mm -hmm. your presentation now, Martin. Yes, yes. Okay, then I will try to do it again. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. So, well, basically, uh, I, I wanted to explain again that when I mean imaginary spaces, I'm not referring to uh, anything related to fantasy. Okay, here I'm speaking about some uh, spaces uh, where the story uh, that is narrated takes place. Uh, in this case, well, could be this route or could be this route, but basically we are in the uh, territory of the Amazon, okay? And um, well, basically uh, replying to, to Jacobo also, uh, uh, to Jacobo's question, one of the things that attracted me the most of this, uh, of this, uh, ser this trilogy of graphic novels was the diversity of the uh, graphic styles, no? And um, well, as you, can, as you can appreciate from these examples, uh, we are, uh, there is basically in this trilogy, we are uh, seeing three different moments in the, in the story of Lope de Aguirre, of this uh, uh, Spanish conquistador who basically rebelled against the King of Spain and organized a rebellion that ended up in, in complete disaster. But, uh, well, we see three phases of his story in very different styles, no? The first one is by Enrique, Enrique Brescia, uh, who has a very naturalistic, very detailed uh, style, very colorful as well. Uh, and then the second one is by Federico del Barrio, whom, as Jacobo has highlighted, he makes a lot of use of the, of the black color, but also a lot of very lively flat colors, and he simplifies a lot the, uh, well, uh, the shapes that uh, it's, it's far more impressionistic. No? And then we have uh, Ricard Castells, who uh, takes us a little bit farther in that process of abstraction uh, until, uh, well, basically it's a very experimental comic where basically what we see is blots of ink, uh, very irregular lines, and uh, basically we have to make a, a great effort to imagine what is going on there. Uh, basically my explanation for these uh, different styles or these three degrees of abstraction uh, I focused basically in two dimensions. One was basically, uh, well, uh, it, it describes uh, an evolution on the morals of the characters, you know, and, and basically on the limits, on the moral limits, where uh, in the beginning, basically uh, actions and consequences and transgressions are very clearly drawn. Uh, in the second one, there's a subversion of this, uh, of this order. Uh, different limits are drawn and, uh, and a, a different, more rough and more extreme status quo is set. And then in the third one, uh, basically, uh, we are in a situation of vacuum, moral vacuum, and basically there's, there's, the, the, the rules are not that clear and the limits are completely blurred and erased. 
And um, well, another reason that uh, may justify these uh, three different graphic styles would be that in La Ventura, nature is presented with a, in, in a bait uh, documental fashion. You no, know? it, it might be more as experienced by an explorer who's trying to uh, understand and dominate and name everything that he's encountering, you know, a bit like uh, in the first chronicles of the conquest uh, could be appreciated, you know? like there's certain, uh, uh, they, they are trying to basically name and describe everything that they are doing. La Conjura, however, uh, this uh, in La Conjura, that vision has been simplified, uh, they, they use more schematic shapes and colors. And this, in my opinion, may denote a certain habituation or fatigue to an environment that no longer fascinates them. Uh, Jacobo uh, noticed clearly that there's a, 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 an abundance of black, but there's also a, basically the, it's, the, the colors are much more flat in a sense. You know, there's, there's not the volume of the shapes that Enrique, Enrique Brescia, Brescia used to give to those images. And then in La Expiación, in the space is, okay, it's more uh, reduced to blots and irregular lines, which uh, basically places in a ter territory of basically of a, uh, of a fugitive now who's basically uh, living in, in frenzy and paranoia. Um, well, basically uh, later, uh, uh, some things that the, we didn't mention is also that uh, I try to draw some parallels with uh, certain, uh, well, some with some other works that have de dealt with the same uh, stories. And also I try to uh, describe how uh, these comics try to uh, pay attention also to the acoustic landscape of those of of that of that territory and that place where we are, uh, where the story takes place. Um, that was yeah. my answer to Hago. Thank you very <laughs> much, Martin. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, now let's give thanks for discussion. Mm -hmm. Does anyone have a thumbnail, mm -hmm. please? Okay, I'm speaking too much this morning. <laughs> I, I try to keep it brief. Um, uh, I just, I was wondering, um, these, uh, maybe uh, this is just a suggestion, which I, I, mm -hmm. I thought of after reading your presentation. Uh, well, you have, you, you mentioned it, uh, Alberto Brecha's version, which is, mm -hmm. but why not include it in this uh, trilogy? And, that, mm -hmm. that, that, that'd be one question. And the other one is like, I think it'd be interesting if maybe you could uh, put more emphasis in the production, production context, namely, this is, these are uh, you know, how these uh, graphic novels uh, were, um, were done, were uh, planned, and this being 1992, which was like the mm -hmm. uh, 500 year anniversary of the and that's when you start having mm -hmm. trouble. Do you call this conquest? Do you call this discovery? And you know, it's like it was a very highly politicized um, uh, moment where the EZLN in Mexico uh, emerged and, and mm -hmm. came out. Uh, so there, there are very um, a series of, I, I say, political statements regarding Latin American history and its uh, relation with Europe, especially with Spain, uh, in these graphic novels. Uh, so that that historical production context, I think, is like key to understand, and especially why uh, the figure of Lope de Aguirre. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, I'm going to wait a bit. Very good question, all of them. The first one is uh, why why didn't I include more of Alberto Breccia's graphic novel? Uh, I had my I, I thought about it, although uh, well, for me the the main problem was extension. No, I already was dealing with uh, three books. No, that uh, are in in a way quite complicated, quite complex. 
no uh, in their language and in their uh, and basically I, I wanted to simplify a little bit my presentation it is true that if i choose to turn this into a paper or continue with the research i would certainly include uh, alberto breccia's book Although there are certainly, well, I, I try to point into into some uh, comparisons in my in my in the in the work that I submitted, uh, such as that uh, surprisingly, well, surprisingly, uh, not that much if you if you know the styles of these uh, of these artists, but there's more in common uh, aesthetically between uh, Alberto Breccia and, in my opinion, and, and Federico del Barrio and Ricard Castells than uh, with his own son, uh, Enrique Breccia. Uh, there's uh, um, uh, also, I think that uh, the Alberto Breccia's El Delirio, no? El, uh, it's uh, it's, in, in that, uh, it's also very uh, impressionistic, a little bit uh, psychedelic. Uh, also remember, it, which also reminds us particularly of Del Barrio. Uh, in a, and in a sense also, I think it's, uh, it's very adequate to that representation of uh, how this, uh, how Lope de Aguirre loses his mind and uh, uh, well, or, or doesn't lose his mind, but uh, lets himself be carried away, you know, by his, uh, by all this violence. Um, uh, regarding the production, I think uh, also I, uh, that's something that uh, would would be worth exploring. Uh, I find also a, a big contrast between these works and. Uh, the current historical historical comics, which tend to be a bit more pedagogical, they 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 tend not to use that much uh, formal experimentation. They're more focused on uh, transmitting clearly uh, some testimony or some version of the story, whereas these are more, in my opinion, uh, trying to imagine how uh, those moments could have been for the protagonists of that history. Uh, so in, in, a, in a way, I think even that even uh, if some of, uh, well, basically Castells and, and Del Barrio's styles are uh, not, uh, they, they tend a, a little bit towards uh, abstraction, they, they are still trying to uh, put ourselves put the reader in the shoes of the of the uh, characters that uh, that are in the story um, about why Aguirre well uh, it's that comes also from a from a personal interest in this in this character that in my in my opinion uh, incarnates uh, 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 that uh, archetype of uh, the the man who's basically transformed by the wilderness, no, um, uh, who basically uh, lets uh, acquire some uh, 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 larger than life status, if you want, uh, through that uh, through that exposure, no such what might happen to to courts in the heart in heart of darkness or what might happen in a in a more idealist way to tarzan or kazar or all these uh, characters that basically get lost in the jungle and suddenly they turn into superhumans you know uh, so yeah <laughs> that, I, I hope that i ask i answer your questions mm -hmm. is there jorge please Mm -hmm. Hi, Martin. Um, I have yeah. a, a comment, a question. I, I like your paper and it was, it was really ambitious to have these three works and then present mm -hmm. on them or just five minutes or, or respond mm -hmm. to a presentation about it. Um, but mm -hmm. I was intrigued by how you started the, the, the paper with the concept of the imaginary. Mm -hmm. you, you clearly comment that the imaginary is, is not to be taken as something like fantastic or, or it's mm -hmm. very much a place. We are talking about 
uh, an area. Um, hmm. And I was thinking that if you turn these, uh, these notes and these, these reflections into a paper, and then you include maybe Alberto Breccia's uh, book as well, maybe <laughs> unpacking a little bit more the concept of the imaginary would be useful. <laughs> because there is a very interesting body of literature with um, the imaginary and then the different adjectives mm -hmm. that go with it, like the, spy, the spatial imaginary, the social imaginary, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, there's work by Charles Taylor on the social imaginary, which is really, really interesting. And actually, mm -hmm. one colleague of us here at Newcastle works on the spatial imaginaries and mm -hmm. she's great. I attended a presentation she gave and, and some of her papers, she develops, you know, and yeah, explains the concept of the imaginary, mm -hmm. how we can apply it to um, in a spatial way, but also in social terms. And I think mm -hmm. it combines really nice with what you were presenting on the level of abstraction and the level of introspection in this work, some of them really more uh, allowing us to be in the psyche of, of, the, mm -hmm. of the protagonist. Um, and I think that goes along very, very well with also placing, you know, how this imaginary, what this imaginary means for, at the time, historically, for these um, conquistadors, uh, what, that it, what it meant for them and, and what it means, you know, throughout history. So I think uh, developing that maybe could be something to, mm -hmm. to bear in mind, yeah. Um, thank you, thank you. Uh, well, about the spatial, sp spatial imaginary, I'm not that familiar with that uh, field of study. Um, my source of inspiration was more like uh, some, some uh, works that have been done in, in literature, for example, related to uh, the creation of these uh, landscapes. Uh, there's a, um, a Spanish, uh, I think he's, he's, uh, he was Uruguayan, uh, researcher called uh, Fer uh, Fernando Ainsa, who worked a lot about the concept of geopoetics, vale, geopoetica, and then also uh, there, uh, in, in the field of geography, there's been also uh, some researches done on the, uh, well, for example, on the, uh, the la geografía del paisaje, no, the geography on landscape of landscape who try to basically focus a little bit uh, on the cultural dimension of uh, of landscape no and uh, um, my my intention it was basically uh, because i was very interested in this process or or in the way that uh, these authors create uh, they, they 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 build that world no as uh, as the uh, as Speaking from that also in that concept of world building as well, but uh, when we're dealing also with a real place that has been chronicled and has been de dealt with uh, uh, by 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 witnesses as well, no? And uh, well, I I also hope that I I answered your question. <laughs> But thank you. I, I'm, yeah, thank I'm you. taking note of all these uh, ideas that you're giving me. <laughs> okay, there's one question, one more, and one last question. Sorry. Yeah, thank you very much. Actually, you have uh, started to answer what I wanted to uh, ask about the imaginary, not only as a landscape, but also cultural expectations. You've <laughs> mentioned that you want to look through the perspective of the persons, real historical persons being there, uh, like to transmit it and reflect it in uh, mm -hmm. the comics. And um, the, the, my comment is that we know that uh, the Europeans, once they were there in the historical period, real period, they were full of all um, fears and mm -hmm. they had an idea and uh, let's say a construct, cultural construct, what they thought they could find there. And uh, sometimes it's like that I'm expecting to find something there and finally I find it there. That means that they had an, a slight ideas but they projected them in the reality so that the fear is not that big. Whether it might be productive in that case, 
in this case, in mm -hmm. Lotte, because mm -hmm. the, there is always this uh, aspect uh, coming mm -hmm. into, into question, like to see also not only the person as a courageous uh, explorer, but a person mm -hmm. who does not know what's going to happen mm -hmm. around the corner. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much for... Yeah, I, I do agree that um, also I think that these graphic novels, uh, as, I, I will, I, as I tried to hint in one of the slides, uh, they, they sometimes represent some of the periods that we can appreciate or faces that we can appreciate in the chronicling of, uh, of uh, uh, in the in the chronicas de Indias, no? of, uh, in, of the chronicles of of the of the Spanish conquistadors, if you uh, well or, or not Spanish, like uh, uh, if we read uh, Columbus's first uh, reports, uh, like he's constantly marveling about the, the beauty of the natives, and uh, uh, he's constantly uh, describing this landscape as uh, full of marbles. Also, because he's trying to sell his project, no. But uh, also, uh, in, you can also appreciate some 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 elements of uh, trying to document uh, what he's saying, what he's seeing, no. And bringing it to what he knows, uh, with a lot of comparisons with the harbors or the places that he knows from from Europe, no. And and that could be a little bit uh, what we get sometimes from Enrique Breccia's book. No? Whereas then some, some later chronicles are less detailed in that sense, and they focus more on the action. And basically they put us in a, in a more, uh, in a less uh, clear territory, no? more uh, unclear in, in, many, in many aspects. No? Mm -hmm. Gracias. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. So we're going to continue our chat around a cup of coffee or tea, whatever you want. You have 13 minutes.